Greetings everybody, I'm Jeremiah. That's him. She's Vanya. That's me. Welcome to another episode of the Beat and Curls podcast, where we talk about dating, relationships, marriage, mental health, and so much more. Before we proceed, smash that subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube or follow us on one of your favorite platforms for more great content going forward. So what are we talking about today, love? Today we're going to be talking about the human race. Trust me, we're going to go all the way in. You don't want to miss this. Cue that intro. What's up, guys? It's your girl, Margo Bingham. Karen Parsons. You're now tuned in. You're now tuned in. You're now tuned in. You are now tuned in. You are now tuned in to Beard and Curls. 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 Keep it locked. Our guest today is an actor, writer, director, and filmmaker. Honestly, he doesn't need any introduction. You know him. You love him. Mikhail. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank All right. You. So these days, there are lots to talk about race, lots to talk about race. Now, some of the most prominent historical figures, such as Rosa Parks, talks about mm -hmm. being, there being one human race. What's right. your take on that? You know, it's a funny thing. I, I just sent somebody a, a letter, um, and I, I used that quote almost. It, it went, people are different. We should embrace that. There's one race, the human race, and what we need to focus on is the appreciation of what makes us different instead of harping on separating because of those differences. And I think what has happened is people have forgotten what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. They've lost their compassion for someone else's struggle. And it used to be a form of respect. Like we could respect the Jewish from, for, for the Holocaust and how they came out of it, held on to their traditions and focused on education and, and took their families. And, and now it's like, it's, we, we somehow got caught up in like um, conspiracies and things that, that make one group and their differences better than another group and their differences. And what happens is in this world, we all have to live together. No one's gonna be disrespected. It's a problem. People don't understand freedom comes with responsibility, especially if you're gonna be free in this world, in this society, which is, which is an appreciation for other people's right to pursue it too. People think that pursuing freedom means you have to take freedom, the freedom from someone else. That's not freedom. That's, that's the complete opposite of it. You know what I mean? So, so trying to demean one group of people by, by, by saying they're less than so that another group of people can feel like they're more than in a group that is the same is, uh, it's counterproductive. And so I, I have great respect for Rosa Parks because, because she, she, just defied the norm. She just refused to be told something that wasn't right. And what I like about life, history, is like, so the, the Nazis, they did what they did and then they thought once, the, once it was over, they could then blend back into society and say, no, but I was doing what I was told. But what we, what we learned is, no, then we hunt you down and we try you for crimes against humanity. Because at some point, your moral code has to be greater than some law that's been bestowed on you. And you have to let that moral code dictate your behavior or you will deal with the consequence of that. And so these fools who are setting out to do very violent, destructive things under the belief system that somehow they're better than somebody else because at this particular time they're in the front, just remember, first will be last and last will be first. And when the last is first to you, how would you like for them to look upon you? Because th if they treat you like you treat them, there's gonna be, you're gonna have it. I mean, and you weren't good to them, you're gonna have yourself an issue. And that, that's really what I think is boiled down to. It's like black people who were slaves really weren't treated well. And now that particular different kind of people, different melanin in our skin type people are changing in our, ways to contribute to society were becoming much more effective and productive and produce. And now you look back on it and like you see the human, the, the inhumane 
treatment and you want to you want it addressed because it's been addressed in every other despicable act in history except slavery you know like nobody really wants to talk about it but we got to talk about it no one's trying to use it as a crutch we just want to talk about it so that we understand you understand and then we can let go and you can it can pop it can be brought out we can let go of it and find ways to really really work together as one human race trying to make the most of every opportunity we have as people on this earth why do you think it's so hard for people in this country to come together and have some of those crucial conversations to have some of those more difficult conversations I'm, a, I'm gonna go, I've, I've said this about myself because I believe it, I'm gonna deal with what I think we can control. No one wants to be party to something that ugly. No one wants to believe, you know, everyone wants to talk about like it happened 100,000 years ago. Uh, Cause they just would rather it be 100,000 years ago. But it didn't happen 100,000 years ago and in some places it's still happening. But I think there are a lot of, of people with a little more melanin in their skin who are mad and don't want an apology. That's making it difficult because the couple of times people try to apologize, our response to that is, oh, so what you gonna do? And then whatever they do, our next response is, well, that's not enough. But, but I'd like to look at it like this. Um, we can't bake a cake just because it the oven's hot like you got to get the ingredients to the you got to mix all that up that takes some time and you got to put it in there but i just want the ingredients on the table i would i i just think that um it's too ugly to want to be held responsible because once you can hold people responsible then they have to own the right of the fact that they contribute to the action so what everybody wants to pretend is everybody who had a plantation no longer alive. And um, everyone who ever had a slave, you know, lived during George Washington's time. And, you know, we need to get over it. All of that may be true as far as human beings are concerned, but the institutions, they're still here. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know what I mean? So like we, we are on to something right now. I don't like the, I don't like the violence that's attached to it because it allows people to get distracted. I mean, they wanna say we don't deserve because whatever. And every time something like that breaks out, they get to steer the conversation away from it. You know what I mean? It's away from just acknowledging and having the conversation. So one of the things that you mentioned is that some people don't know how to accept the apology mm -hmm. and it's not enough, right? So yeah. can you tell a little bit more about that? Like what would be enough or will there ever be enough? You know, I think um, if the apology is sincere, um, the action behind it will be enough. And I've got a lot of friends who've reached out to me. I didn't know your life was that complicated because I'm not a complainer. I didn't know, you know, that you were up against so much because I'm not a complainer. And I, I want to know what I could do. And I said, you're already doing it. Like a lot of the people I hang around with at least have never treated me like there was any, like we were any different and never given me any of that energy. That's why they're still around me. So like it starts there when you can see someone as equal mm -hmm. and then implement that into your livelihood where they don't feel it. And that's another thing. They should stop telling people who are offended that, that they're not offended. You can't tell me what offends me. I'm telling you, I'm offended. As the offender, whether you meant to do it or not, you have to take ownership of that action and let's and work with the person that feels offended or slighted to get them through it. If if that were happening, like people want to tell us, um, what we should be all right with. And it's like, but you, you, you don't worry about your kids like I do. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to give your son the, the five steps at six years old. You don't have to explain why when you get pulled over, you're in a traumatic state and lose all manhood. Like, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have to be embarrassed 
by uh, the shrinkage that takes place uh, as a man when they when I'm being questioned by police. Like, you don't have that problem with your children. Like, I do. So don't tell me I don't, not to worry. I'm worried. Don't tell me uh, it's nothing to be afraid of. I'm afraid. Don't tell me I, you just got to figure it out. No, I'm not going to figure out how to make something wrong right. I want you to figure out how to fix what's wrong. And then, and then we'd be good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I like that. It seems like there's a lack of empathy to go along with that lack of an apology. And so absolutely. And no one's accepting that. No one like in any relationship, we keep saying we want to be in a relationship in a real societal, uh, societal in society with function where everyone can relate to one another. Well, that takes respect. And respect for something means you're willing to listen to that person's voice and give it the same kind of credibility you give your own. Mm -hmm. that, you know, otherwise you're in a dictatorship where that means you get to lay down the law and now the rest of the people gotta lay down. Like, that's not a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's true. And actually, the only thing you have to ask yourself is, what would I do if I would be in that situation? It's so really, if, it goes right back to that biblical little thing your grandma used to tell you, treat others mm -hmm. the way you would like to be treated. So ask yourself, when you have your knee on someone's neck, would you like to be treated like that? Mm -hmm. When you're telling someone you can't breathe and they push down harder, would you like to be treated like that? Mm -hmm. When you, you know, get a gun pulled out on you and put in your face because you were a little slow pulling out your license. Would you like to be treated like that? Like, this isn't difficult. This isn't difficult. And if, and people say, well, being a policeman is a hard job. Well, then don't take the job. Mm -hmm. Being a doctor is hard too. Like, don't take the job if you don't want to save lives. Don't take the job if you're scared when you pull people over. Like, you're obviously not in the, in the mental, don't have the mental fortitude to perform as a public servant. So get out of the game. Stop signing up for jobs because of the money, the pension. It, it just, just do something else. But it can't be okay that you acted a certain way because you brought something to the situation of your own and treated it as a criminal activity before you even got the information. That can't be that can't ever be okay. I think, if I'm not mistaken, not too long ago, North Carolina became like one of the first states to kind of start, you know, offering reparations. To that's right. That's right. People of African descent. So tell me a little bit about what your thoughts on that are. You know, it's funny. The problem with the check is in this country, we've established, we, we've got this stigma to welfare. Like, it's a stigma attached to it. Like, well, you can't get out and earn your money on your own. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're talking about. I can get out and make money of my own. If you come to my house and you rob me, and then I find you, and, 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 you, and I can put a price on how much you've stolen from me, I can then go to court and sue you. And they will award me, based on your unlawful act, compensation. Slavery what is an unlawful act. It's an inhumane act. You robbed these people of, of their culture, their history, everything, their families, like, and then set them free with no real sense of, of support to actually free them. So they end up going back to the plantations and you called it sharecropping. But there was nothing being shared. Like you own the crops and we got to be lowly paid slaves. So, so like that was never equal so that freedom wasn't possible. So in order to just level that out so that when you say, all oh, men, we did this so that all men, all people could be created equal, you really made a, an effort to take some people that you started from way back here and e unequal things off. It's, it's old money. It, and yeah, I can go out and make more money. The point is, you, you've robbed 
So you're paying back money that that's due so that the people that you robbed from at least have something to say for all that work. Like it's like a lay, it's like working and getting paid at the end of the month, except we, we worked for years and we and I put our money away for uh, 40 years. So now you can just come on back and you can add it up. You do it all the time. Like every time you put somebody in jail and they're innocent and they get out 20 years later, you put a number to it. Like this isn't difficult. So let's just back up. See how many years as a sworn slave, let's you know, and get your numbers right and then write a check. Oh, we don't have the money. We just, the pandemic just proved there's checks. <laughs> In fact, you're about to write another one. So we got money. We got money. So that's not a problem. Trust me. We, God just showed you in your closet there's a chest and and you know if he needs to remind you that there's money to be gotten um he just did he tapped you on your shoulder said there's a chest right a couple of checks you wrote half billion checks to dead people you wrote uh, you know what I mean it's like so like if you really want really want there to be an energy attached to this apology Germany has shown you how to go about really evening the playing field I feel you now, so here's the thing, though, Mikhail, and I appreciate everything you share, man. That's that's real powerful. I like how you started it off as far as, like, saying that it's not about, like, not being able to earn your own money. It's not about just handouts. I don't think anybody's asking for handouts. It's more like what you were saying, like, doing the right thing by a group of people that, you know, had a terrible act done to them. And so it's, yes. more, it's you know, writing that wrong. Writing that wrong. When did writing the wrong become wrong? Isn't that what an apology is? You know what an insurance company does? You pay them, and then when you have an accident, they have to write that. Like, they have to make the car whole again. That's why you get the check. So that works there, because it's a billion dollar, trillion dollar industry. Like, you can understand that whole right the wrong thing in every other functioning capacity except this one. But as soon as you start hearing about writing slavery, it just gets lost in the, um, you know, handout conversation. Mm -hmm. One thing they can know, you can know about people who don't have, they're done waiting for handouts. They don't come. There's a myth that when you don't have something that you're just seeing around trying to have a baby so you can get something given to you. Have you lived that life? Like people <laughs> who tell me that, I'm like, uh, yeah, I have a lot of relatives who struggle. Like that's a hard life. To keep having baby routine so you can stay on the uh, on the government page. That's a hard life. There's nothing attractive about that life. Y'all act like that's the easy ticket. People who say that, like, you know, talk about that particular thing. They talk about it like it's easy. Like, then why aren't you doing it? Like, who doesn't want to do the easy thing? Because it ain't easy. Listen, when you work hard and then you get paid, there's a sense of pride. It's called self-respect. Right. You think that that people are trading in self-respect for some government check, you are mistaken. They just want the opportunity to put themselves in a position to work hard at something and get that check that they worked for. If you really understand what's going on and you, and you understand how far behind this whole situation has, has forced a lot of generations of people and you feel bad about it, why not give them the opportunity to work themselves out of it? Nobody's asking you to take your opportunities and not have them. We're saying open up the opportunities so everyone has a chance at it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm with you on that. I think to that point, it's like I always say, like, 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 like a parent who has like multiple kids, like you have three kids or something like that. And so you have the first one, you love on them. You have the second one. You find room in your heart to love that one just as much. Absolutely. And it's like you're taking away from the love for the first one. Absolutely. The second or the third one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And like, which one do you love the best? What? Touch mm -hmm. either one of them and you will know. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like, I love them both the best. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a, but you like one better than the other. They're like shoes. I need both of them. Mm -hmm. And I need the right one to do what it do on the right foot and the left one to do what it do. And I love them both on the, on the feet. You understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is, um, there's this desire to be like, but more than, but less than. People don't want to hear equal. Mm -hmm. 
because then you can't mm -hmm. hand out the trophy. You understand? If people are equal, then there's no trophy to be given out. And we're we're a society that likes to that likes to distinguish between the best and the worst. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. instead of like trying to figure out why these people can't do what these people are doing, we want to keep that distance between these two people so we can always feel like they're below these people and these people can always have somebody to kind of look up to instead of like uh, seeing it as a, as a bridge between the two. There's a lot that can be done. The question is like, why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so earlier you mentioned your son and that there are certain things that you need to teach teach him, right? Yep. Like, can you share a little bit more about that? Like how do you keep him inspired? I've tried to provide him with an environment where the trauma I suffered as a young uh, African-American kid, he doesn't have to. Uh, and um, I think I've done a hell of a job of that. And that in itself has allowed him to be much freer than I, ha than I was. My son was on Broadway with Denzel Washington at 13. You know what I mean? So like uh, doing Raising in the Sun, uh, glory be to God. And, and uh, I let him do that on his own with his grandma. Like I, I just visited to give him that sense because he, he's always been a, a super intelligent kid and he's, and he's a responsible kid and he's well-mannered. And um, so, once I got those things, me and my wife put those things in him and my mother, I, I got into the important things, which were like the unfairness. And that's the thing that's really disappointing because up until like 16, he didn't even really understand the difference between him and his white friends. And, his, and because this isn't the South, um, uh, praise God. And so he's never been called out of his name. Uh, and, I was called out of my name in the thousands daily. Wow. Uh, so um, he's never had to deal with uh, that viciousness. So, so when we talk, he thinks I'm in like another planet. When I'm like, okay, listen, you can't pull your, there's this game where they pull their car up and they grab a basketball and they go dunk on other people's goals. Yeah, drive by dunking. Drive by dunking. And so, one day, uh, I didn't know nothing about it because I, I see him getting uh, dressed up. I'm like, you balling? You balling? He's like, yeah. I said, okay, what are you balling? I'm, I am get in. He's like, oh, no, no. Me and my friends are going to football. And I said, okay, so where? And he's like, well, wherever there's a goal. I didn't like that answer. Wherever there's a goal. Okay, so what does that mean? And he's like, you ever heard of this? And then he tells me. It. And I'm like, so you're running. Here he is with his hoodie because he's fashionable. Uh, you know me, I'm thinking Trayvon Martin. He says, I'm gonna, he's gonna run onto some stranger's lawn wherever the car finds the hoops and jump out the car, run and get dunk on the basketball goal and then run back to the car. Mm -hmm. Because his white friends can do it. And I said, listen, bro, here's where you're gonna think I'm crazy. If someone looks outside the window and sees a young black hood, kid like yourself in a hoodie running to the car, they're not going to think you're playing a fun game of drive-by dunking. They're going to think you're running from a drive-by robbery. Mm -hmm. They're going to, and it only takes one of them, get in their car and proceed to issue a citizen's arrest. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna put you in a situation with a gun that's in their hands. And your white friends won't, 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 this won't happen to them. They're gonna run at you. And so I have to say, you're not going. And then he was like, I'm going. And I said, you're not going. And then he was like, I'm going. And I looked at him. And you know, one thing you get from your daddy is that look. I gave him the look like, I'm not joking. You're not going. And if I have to get in the car and accost all your friends who fear me, 
They've seen a couple of my fight movies and they don't want any part of it. <laughs> I promise you, you won't go. Oh yeah, and they and they know. And I got another one coming out called Paper Tiger. They know. They don't want it. They don't want any part of what I'm doing. So um, they they that ended that. Uh, and I just realized that conversation. I'm the only dad in that car. There's four four boys. They had to have it. I'm the only dad in that car out of the four kids. They had to have the conversation about where you put your hands when they pull you over, how you turn the, the map light on and how you put your hands out the window and don't do anything on ash. I'm the only guy that's had to talk to his kid about that with him before he got his license. I don't want to deal with the result of being uh, blinded by my desire for this world to be better than it is. I deal with the facts, as I said about the corona. Okay, maybe some people think it ain't, and maybe some people think it is, but here's my only question. You gonna let a $1.99 mask either get in the way of you losing someone just to prove you were right? Like, I don't understand. They say it's a possibility. There's enough scientists to say that it's real. There's enough people who you can ask who've been to funerals. So there's enough reason to believe it's a possibility. Put the mask on, bro. Just like you didn't have a problem putting on drawers. You don't have a problem putting on like underwear. You don't have a problem putting on bras. Like, and it, I don't understand. We, it's called in the, it's called decency and decent. Like, put the mask on. It's a dollar ninety nine. So you want your freedom? You want to go anywhere you want to go? Put the mask on. Like you see what happens when you don't. Now we're all in the house. It's like here we go again. Like it's like we're all three years old, and your parents told you don't do it. If you do that, you're punished. Now we're all punished because we don't. We don't want to be responsible. I don't even understand. We, you know, it's like you have to have a license to drive a car. Now it's not infringing on your freedom. We just need to know you got to have a license to own a fire weapon. That's not uh, telling you you can't own a fire weapon. That's telling you to be responsible with it. You, you know, all these rules, you have to, you, but seatbelt, you get yourself a ticket. Look at them, violating your constitutional right. Really? I, I, it's not political. It's like no one's asking you uh, what lever you're pulling and then telling you buy the mask. It's like if you don't care and you don't believe it, for the people that do, be decent. It's just about kindness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's the thing, bro. We're not kind anymore. We aren't kind. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're kind of a people, but we ain't, we're not kind people. Wow, so it kind of brings us back full circle. I wanted to go back to like where we started out with like talking about the human race. Mm. It's like, you know, uh, you're talking about we're not kind of kind as a people and all these different things. So where did we lose our way? as a society to be able to really just Oh out. man, there's a great quote. It says, um, some, uh, I, I wanna say, uh, it says, somehow human beings have gotten away from valuing humans and are now into valuing things. So when you start to value things instead of people, that's when that's where we lose your way because now how do you get things by abusing you can abuse other people and take their stuff now you have things and no one asked the dude who pulls up in the ferrari how he got it no one asked the guy with the gucci belt and the louis vuitton suit how he got it we just attribute instant attention to having it and so once we started that what happens is people feel worthless because they've been poor, they're uneducated. So then they want to look like they're important. So here comes the things. So then even when we can't afford the things, we start buying the things. And then we get to seem important, even though we have nothing. And the more things you have, the more you realize you don't have things that other people have. And the more things you want and don't have the means to get them, the more you're willing to do to get them so that you can then have some self-value. So at some point, the things become far more important to you than the person you're taking them from or than the person you're going to hurt to get them or the person you're going to lie to or steal from or go into business with. It becomes like pursuit of things, not happiness. 
the quote went, we're human beings, but we suck at being human. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's the thing. We're all human beings, but man, when it comes to being human, to being kind, those things, they've gotten away from us. I appreciate that. So I want to actually go back to, um, you know, just again, making the connections as far as like, um, yeah. you know, things being political and how to avoid, you know, making things political. Like even like with this topic of like one human race, mm -hmm. you know, some people might even hear that and they may hear that as saying like all lives matter. And so <laughs> where do we <laughs> separate that? And, and, and what, what's your take on that? All lives do matter. So why don't black ones? <laughs> <laughs> that's my whole, yeah, that's exactly our point. All lives do matter. So then why not ours? I feel like I don't really understand what the problem is. No one's saying black lives only matter. <laughs> you keep putting words in, and if you get to define what somebody else is saying, then of course it becomes whatever you want. Mm -hmm. It's Black Lives Matter too. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter also. No one didn't say your, your life did not matter. We're talking about the fact that some people are acting like Black Lives don't. You can't answer that question with all lives matter. The question is not, do all lives matter? The question is, why are some people acting like black lives don't? So let's, let's matter then. Mm -hmm. let, you know, it, all of us can't matter if black people are getting killed, sons, black men are being slaughtered in the street like this. That's all lives don't matter. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. that, that means that they're working against you too. So amen, all lives matter. Get your black lives matter t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Then you check in, make your phone call to your con, get out in the streets and re-police your police. And listen, I love the police. I took my daughter to the police force and made her do a book report so that she can have the relationship with police better than the one I have. I want to break that concept that they're not here to provide and serve. There's a lot of really good ones. I have great friends on the service. Some are lieutenants like, I know some brothers of all colors, see when I say brothers, I'm not just talking about skin, I'm talking about brothers, of all, they need, they, they, yeah, we need cops. I'm telling you, we need the police. I, I'm in circles, you're not in, we need them. Uh, we don't need crooked ones. Anywhere else in the world is somebody bad, they throw you out. When you're in a football league and they catch you with cocaine and gun in your pocket, you're out. You're in a basketball league, you test dirty for drugs, you're out. The police, you beat somebody down, kill them, you get 17 years of pension, you're in. Like, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. He had 17 charges, four of them all misappropriate behavior, and he's still on the street. Well, what, what, I don't understand. Like, he's bad. Get rid of that thing. Exactly. But they, they, so this is it. This, this defunding the police. Can we, can we rephrase this, please? It's, re, it's reappropriating the funds so that it doesn't go in the pockets of the crooked ones. Like, we're not trying to tell you to defund the police. We're trying to say that program, that's got to go. The uh, breaking in people's house without warrants, that, that one's got to go. The um, racial uh, profiling, yeah, that's got to go. Uh, you know, we're funding these things. Right, right. We don't mean, so this ridiculous, what happens if your wife and daughter are getting raped? I'm calling police. This is a, and I don't want them to come to my house. I want them to take care of business. Right, right. Yeah, but if you send a crook one to my house and he accosts me because he thinks I'm the criminal because in his mind he's already decided that I am, I'm going to bring the full blunt of the law onto his neck. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of ask about Hollywood for a little bit. So obviously you're in the industry. Uh, you know a lot more about this than I would. So there's been this push, a lot of... Like, if because I, I can remember growing up, like, I, I remember seeing all these movies about race, especially slavery. Like, I remember, like, Amistad, like, when I was a teenager, and then, like, even recently, like, 12 Years a Slave, last year, Harriet. And so, why do you think there's this push to keep putting these movies out? And so, I don't know where you stand on that, but I've always thought about it. I'll just share my own views on it. It's like, okay, so if we're trying to bring everybody together as one race, why where's the significance in continuing to remind one race that hey you know this race own that race or 
these people are these people own these people are slaves and all this other stuff. So what's your take on that? Like what is the significance of putting these movies out? Okay, so I'm gonna say two things. As a filmmaker myself, I failed to I'm gonna take full responsibility. I have a problem with them, but it's not like I've taken my time and my money to recreate a telling of it like it should be told. Because I think the problem with slavery movies is the recipe is there's a white Jesus, he comes in, he saves the poor, dark, dumb Negro, and then you know everything's great. Like, what, where would 12 years a slave be without Brad Pitt? Like, if he doesn't move next to that brother, he's in trouble. Like, you know, uh, so, so what happens is, I would rather it be told like a Nat Turner story, where he just wasn't gonna deal with that uh, uh, that inhumane treatment anymore, and then he, he set up a revolt, and he turned it onto them, and he and 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 forced some slaves free, because that's true too. And what happens? What happens is like if what film? What we're trying to do in Hollywood is we're trying to remind America it happened, because America is trying to pretend like it didn't. The only problem is it's kind of glorified. It isn't like Schindler's List. It isn't like when the Jewish go after that freaking Holocaust. They make you feel it. The piano, like you just, you can't even watch. It's like, Lord have mercy. But in the slave movies, it's like, well, look at those black folks. They can handle those whips. Like they just so full of spirit and, and the gospel and all that. They can take that beating. Like, and look how they came out of it, heroes. So I'm upset because I want the atrocity to be I want it out there, like it happened. I want the atrocity. I want babies ripped out of wounds. I want uh, families torn apart. I want whippings where the flesh is being peeled off the back. I mean, we did Passion in Christ and changed the whole church. But we do 12 Years a Slave and hand out Oscars. It's like, not one brother that saw 12 Years a Slave that I spoke to, white, well, again, when I say brother, I mean all, because my circle encompasses all humankind. Uh, was like, man, that was some atro man, can you believe the atrocity? They were all like, yo, my man, he survived it and then he went back and was free. I was like, you know who I thought I liked most in that movie? And they were like, who? I said the brother that jumped off the boat because he never was a slave. He just said, if that's my option, then I'll swim back to Africa. And he jumped back in the water knowing death. That's it ended for me at that point. When he jumped in, I turned TV on. I didn't see the rest of it. And they were all like, that's insane. Your mentality is insane. And I said, think about it. They're, you know where you're going. They're telling you where you're going. There's no hope of them turning the boat around. So is it insane to have the one wish that maybe you can swim back? Maybe you can make it. Maybe another boat picks you up. Maybe there are options in the water. There's no option on shore. Hmm. Like, I think um, I'm start too. They all end with this enormous pride and like, so they think that's why they think we're okay. That's why they think we need to let it go because Hollywood has taught us that we've survived it and Obama's president. But unfortunately, 75% of my family is still in, 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 in under the poverty line. And go to the doctor once every 12 years. It should have been 12 years of doctor visit, not 12 years of slave. It should be like every 12 years we get to go to the doctor. Like wow. we leave a lot of uncles, I've lost prostate cancer. It can be treated, but they can't go to the hospital. It, you know, all Obamacare, this and Obamacare, that. For the first time, because they were forced to pay for it, they went. And I've had uncles treated for cancer. I've had, uh, you know, they're still here because they had to go because one thing about us is what we, once we pay for it, we want all of it. Why much is that? How much is the buffet? Then we don't want to go home. Like sometimes you have to teach people how to treat themselves. So I, I think Hollywood, it has to be responsible for change. I think it's movie makers and actors. It's our job to introduce the world to real concepts of living together, working together, what true freedom looks like, to tell the stories, because we can impact you. Like people don't want to read, but they should show, show up to watch a television show. Like it, it is on us to teach. And uh, Edwin R. Murrow said it's the biggest classroom in the world, the television. It's our job as actors, filmmakers, film producers to make sure. You, that's why I don't complain about it. It's like, well, 
I made a couple of movies and none of them were slave based. So I can't be mad that Harriet Tubman came out and it was white. It was water. I don't think it was that much beauty, beauty in it. Like she's beautiful. That ain't right. Everybody's like distinguished. Like you got to show what it does to your spirit. Uh, slavery is submissive. Like it's a form of surrender where you are no longer a man, you're property. Like, it's vicious and um, we've not serviced it properly. I would like the same people that did Schindler's List to do Harry Tubman. I would like the same people who did the piano to do 12 Years of Slave. I would like, yeah, let's get into, cause they have no problem with taking you to, right into the oven. Limbs cooking, cooking right in your face, make you smell it. Let me ask you this though. So like you said, you've never done a slave movie. Was that like intentional or just like a role or an opportunity never was presented to you? Um, unfortunately, like my hero was Sidney Poitier, that royalty and regality um, that he presents. Um, it's always stirred in my spirit, right? I can't fake that. I walk into a room, I can nap the hair up, I can throw on the potato sack, I can, you know, even talk a little, you know what I mean? I can get the draw going, I can do, I can do it. But you look, at, you can see my heart. You, you know, I'm not broken. You know, you know, uh, I'm already escaping. Like I'm already telling the story. So I don't get them. I don't get those roles. Why I haven't made a movie like that it takes a lot of money to go back in history because you have to change. You have to find the right location. You have to change all the wardrobe. Like it's, it's difficult, much more difficult than to tell the story now. And, and until I'm in a situation where I have the backing of a studio or something like that, where they'll take on that lump, I, I try to attack mental slavery. I try to attack prejudice. Um, I try to attack kindness and love and uh, try to get people to see the colorless of, colorlessness of it. And what inspired you to go into the film industry? I turned on the TV one day and I was watching In the Heat of the Night. So I'm watching City Portier and this man I don't know what they call you. And he's and, and one thing leads to another and he slapped him and, and Sydney puts it without a, a hesitation pass back. And he said, they call me Mr. Tips. <laughs> I was like, what just happened? And there was no apology on it. They call me Mr. Tips. And I thought to myself, I just, that, I just have to respect it. I just have to be respected. I mean, it's possible to call a man out on his wrong. It's possible to stand up for what's right. That changed my life. That, that moment, viewing that moment, did more for me than reading James Baldwin and Langston Hughes, like Edward Frederick Douglass, it like, it, just seeing it in real life, like a human being, I thought to myself, I want to I wanna impact somebody else's life. Like that man just impacted mine. So Mikael, how can yeah. someone find you online? Uh, my Instagram, it's Mikael Shannon Jenkins, M-Y-K-E-L-S-H-A-N-N-O-N-J-E-N-K-I-N-S. Mikael, we, we could do this for hours. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> we can, we can, we can, we can. Bro. You know what, man, we're going to stop being, man. We just again want to thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank oh, you. man. Uh, yeah, we thank you for your truly time. Truly blessed and inspired. So appreciate that, bro. Thank you, bro. And um, listen, I got a movie coming out soon called Paper Tigers. I'm really proud of. Um, Jap, it's 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 Asian influenced, like from the producing to the directing. And then I'm uh, I'm blessed enough to be the African American, you know, representing just good hearted, my minority driven, and the film is fantastic i have to come back when it drops okay oh because, yeah yes because, um i want uh I, I want you guys to see it and and you'll see why i'm so yeah. proud so we're down so we will watch the film and then we will invite you back so we can talk about the film For sure. paper tigers yeah when is, when is it coming out exactly 
Well, I'm going in for the ADR tomorrow, okay. which always means we're close. But you see this this girl Corona. She uh she done put the theaters and all that on hold. Like she's in rolling. She she got it. She in control right now. We just trying to. So when when she uh when she decided to give us some privileges, you know what I mean. That's gonna help kind of untie things. But right now she's punishing us for not being disciplined, and um, we taking this punishment. And then uh, we gonna go back to the table and we negotiate with her, and hopefully she gonna free us up a little bit so that we can open up some of these theaters. So that's kind of holding us at bay okay. because I think that they put a lot of love and work in it and they want to put it out in the universe in the most lucrative way they can. And I don't want it. I don't, I'm, I'm patient. I don't want it cheapened in any way. Mm -hmm. But I do have a movie I wrote, directed, called Two Worlds. It's dropping 10 6, okay. 10, 6 this year on, okay. on stream, on all streaming things. That one. I want you to watch and then it's called Two Wolves and it's exactly what I said I do. Exactly what I said I do. Um, and it's and it's a good one. And it's about the wolves inside of each of us and how you can feed the wrong one or the right one. It goes back to like what I said, like people can control how they perceive things and change can happen immediately if you're willing to to feed the right wolf. What's that? All right, brother. Exactly. Watch love. Thomas, uh, Yes. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay Thank smart you. and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Likewise, man. Likewise. My man, my man, my <laughs> lady. Well, there you have it, folks. That's our show for today. Thanks again for tuning in. And as always, like it or not, Beard, Beard and Curls is the new His and Hers. Hers.